Thanks all for joining us for this Gates Institute and PFRH seminar, a seminar series on, on race and reproductive health and family planning and, uh, and how racism has played a part in, in our history, both in the institutions in which we sit, as well as the field itself. Um, we are delighted to have our speakers today and I'll, I'll jump uh, in with, with Karen in just a moment. She is going to continue to moderate. Karen, Karen Thomas has been a co-creator of this series. She is our JHSPH school historian and uh, she's, she's gonna be deeply involved in, in this series as it unfolds the rest of, throughout the rest of this year. We have Michelle Norris who will be joining us from NPR to, to talk about her race card project in October, and we have some other exciting uh, developments coming up in November and December. And so please stay tuned for, for those specific uh, pieces of, of promotion, which you'll, you'll soon see in your email inbox uh, and, and do join us for those. So without further ado, for the race and reproduction or reproductive health seminar, part two, we are going to turn it over to Karen Thomas. Thanks so much, Karen. Take it away. Hi, thank, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, um, Kelly. Uh, I really have the pleasure to introduce uh, two historians that I admire very much. Um, our first speaker will be Aya Nuruddin, um, who is a PhD candidate in the history of medicine uh, as well as a graduate fellow in the JHU Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. Uh, she, in the past, has been a dissertation fellow at the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You may have recognized her uh, in being quoted in the Washington Post on her remarks on Margaret Sanger, or uh, she has been on Somatosphere and Disability History Association podcast, as well as, well as American History TV and C-SPAN. So she does indeed get around. Um, her dissertation is tantalizingly entitled Liberation Eugenics, African Americans and the Science of Black Freedom Struggles, 1890 to 1970. And uh, she is interested, her research interests include uh, history of scientific racism, public health, psychiatry, and disability, um, all of which I think we are all very interested in at the Gates Institute. Um, so uh, that is Aya, and then I will go ahead and also introduce Joanna. Um, Joanna Schoen is professor and associate chair of history at Rutgers University in New Brunswick and she is affiliated with their Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy, and Aging Research. Um, she is the author of two excellent books that have really influenced my work. Um, the first is Choice and Coercion, Birth Control, Sterilization, and Abortion in Public Health and Welfare in the 20th Century. And she uh, did the initial work for this book um, while she was a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill, and I followed after her uh, shortly afterward. Um, she is also the author of the more recent book in 2015, Abortion After Roe, which is also a terrific book and won the Welch Medal of the American Association for the History of Medicine. And intriguingly, she has worked for several decades working with abortion providers to preserve the history of legal abortion in the US. So I will hand it over to Aya. Thank you. Thanks, I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go, all right. Technology, it is, it is daunting, but I think we're getting the hang of it. All right. So I'm gonna get started. I'm talking today specifically about African-Americans and birth control and the ways that that sort of intersects with eugenics. So in a special issue of the Birth Control Review entitled A Negro Number, Dr. Midian Othello Bousfield wrote in his article, Negro Public Health Work Needs Birth Control about his visit 
to Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Clinical Research Bureau in a headquarters in New York City and to the smaller branch that served African Americans in Harlem. At the Harlem branch, he met with his advisory council, which included African American physicians, social workers, and ministers. Bassfield was pleased to discover that the local physicians and ministers had fully embraced birth control activism and its possibilities for uplifting the race. He believed that African Americans needed to be at the forefront of birth control advocacy. Quote, if birth control is to progress rapidly among colored people, it is important that colored physicians, especially women practitioners and colored nurses and social workers be thoroughly initiated, end quote. Basfield was so pleased with his visit that towards the end of his article, he said that, quote, it is time for some colored woman to become the Margaret Sanger of her race. Bousfield had an extensive career and was a staunch birth control advocate. He served as president of the National Medical Association, which was uh, established because African-American physicians couldn't join the American Medical Association. He was also the director of the Negro, a director of Negro Health for the Julius Rosenwald Foundation, which funded a number of African-American medical and education projects, including the Tuskegee Syphilis Study and uh, the birth control clinic in Harlem that, that I had just mentioned. Uh, during World War II, he commanded the first Black Army Hospital at Fort Huachuca in, Al in Arizona, and was the first Black Army uh, Colonel in the medical, Army Medical Corps. His enthusiasm for birth control exemplifies the kinds of conversations and collaborations among African Americans about the potential of birth control for racial improvement. So for my talk today, I want to talk about some of the ways in which African Americans of varying social strata saw reproductive control as part of a eugenic vision for racial improvement. Not only looking at birth control and sterilization, but also the ways that questions of quote unquote better breeding were embedded in the ways that African Americans envisioned racial uplift. And so quickly um, to give some to give us a little context about Margaret Sanger and the and the birth control movement. So this is kind of just a quick overview here, but also that the American eugenics movement and the birth control movement both sort of have their heyday during the progressive era in the, in the early 20th century. And both are sort of largely shaped around discourses of human improvement and the cultural authority of science. Actors in both movements were looking for ways to address social issues like poverty and crime and found reproductive control as useful to that end. Proponents of birth control and eugenicists found common ground, but Margaret Sanger's vision for birth control differed um, from the sort of larger discourses of the eugenics movement because she advocated for all women to be able to control their reproduction, not just women who were deemed eugenically unfit. She also argued that birth control work actually strengthened the work of the eugenicists by preventing what was called racial decay and deliberately borrowed eugenic language to actually bring legitimacy to the birth control movement. And so quickly, I wanna to return to a Negro number, which was the June 1932 issue of the Birth Control Review. Um, the Birth Control Review was the periodical of the American Birth Control League, which was the organization founded by Margaret Sanger and goes through a number of name changes before it becomes Planned Parenthood. And so this issue in particular provides a glimpse into the ways that African-American leaders understand the stakes of reproductive control for racial improvement. A Negro number was a sort of veritable who's who of African-American leadership. W.E.B. Du Bois contributed an article entitled Black Folks and Birth Control uh, that he concluded by stating, quote, that they must learn that among human races and groups, as among vegetables, quality and not mere quantity really counts, end quote. Journalist uh, George Schuyler made similar arguments in his article, Quantity Over Quality, where he asserted that African-Americans needed scientific birth control for racial improvement. At the end of the article, he asked, quote, the question for Negroes is this, shall they go in for quantity or quality in children? Shall they bring children into the world to enrich the undertakers, the physicians, and furnish work for social workers and jailers? Or shall they produce children who are going to be an asset to the group and to American society? Most Negroes, especially the women, would go in for quality production if only they knew how, end quote. Uh, Dr. Walter G. Alexander uh, also contributed his medical expertise to a Negro number. Uh, Alexander, like Bousfield, was an active member of the National Medical Association, and he also would serve uh, with Bousfield on the National Negro Advisory Council of the Birth Control Federation of America. And so the American Birth Control League becomes the Birth Control Federation 
there's a couple other smaller name changes and schisms in between then before it becomes uh, Planned Parenthood that we would recognize today. But they served on this council uh, together in the 1940s. And so Alexander's piece argued that birth control was uh, absolutely central for improving African American life. He stated that, quote, the economic betterment of the Negro, the health betterment of the Negro, and the betterment of community standards, which is an inevitable corollary, uh, demand a policy and a program that will at least modify his un present unfavorable situation. Birth control offers the only reasonable solution. And so these, this is just kind of a sample of some of the questions and ideas that appear in a Negro number, and they function as part of a larger set of, of discourses on eugenics and birth control as parts of racial uplift. These kinds of conversations aren't limited to the birth control review. Rather, these ideas kind of permeate different kinds of scholarship in different areas of, uh, and different forms of media. And so in the same year as uh, a Negro number, Dr. Alexander published uh, a different article in the Journal of the National Medical Association entitled uh, Birth Control for the Negro, a fad or a necessity, where he made a sort of medical, demographic, and moral, moral argument for African-American uh, advocacy around birth control. He asserted that African-American physicians were the stewards of African-American health, and thus it was imperative for them to embrace birth control in this role. Alexander uh, uh, saw the, the sort of centrality uh, of birth control to, to those kinds of questions and stated, quote, I have endeavored in this paper to indicate that birth control is a reasonable, a sane, and a safe program and a procedure. And that because of the peculiar situation of, the ne of Negro living and Negro life, it is particularly uh, uh, applicable to Negroes. And so, so far though, I've kind of focused on a few examples that are, um, about African-American men supporting uh, birth control. There's also African-American women who are deeply invested in its possibilities. And so in addition to this sort of broader set of conversations about birth control for racial improvement, um, birth control had additional significance for African-American women as a way to reclaim reproductive autonomy in response to a long history of sexual violence and exploitation, as well as a set of uh, a long history of racial assumptions that are sort of built in racial science that uh, sort of argued that black women were somehow uh, sexually depraved or uh, promiscuous and hypersexual and all of those things contribute to this long history of sexual violence as well. And so the, the, the possibility of controlling one's own reproduction and targeting it towards uh, racial uplift is sort of in the benefit of the entire race is kind of a, is kind of a vindication of black womanhood but it also puts the onus of racial uplift onto the shoulders of African-American women. And so it's kind of this, this really set, this kind of complicated, but really powerful set of discourses that emerged in sort of the early 20th century. And one really um, rich example of, of African-American women's support of birth control was Dr. Dorothy Bolding Farabee, who was a physician at Howard University. Um, and she was also the second president of the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, and the National Council of Negro Women is really uh, interesting because it's one of the first national women's organizations to actually pass a resolution in support of birth control, which they do in 1941. Um, and so after the passage of this resolution, uh, the National Council of Negro Women actually established a permanent family planning committee that was led by Farabee. And so at the 1942 meeting of the, the Birth Control uh, Federation of America, oh, I should also add that Farabee is also on this National Negro Advisory Council uh, with Basfield and Alexander that I had mentioned earlier. So this, again, there's this kind of also like network of African-Americans who are invested in these conversations. And so she, uh, at the 1942 meeting of the, the Birth Control Federation of America, she presented this paper entitled uh, Planned Parenthood as a Public Health Measure for the Negro Race where she argued that birth control in addressing the sort of medical and socio, the necessity of birth control in, in addressing the sort of medical and socioeconomic problems that were facing African Americans. And she stated that, quote, family planning then becomes a most important part of preventive medicine and should be understood by many more people as a desirable medium for healthful living, a major step towards health and happiness for a greater number of people. And I mentioned this example also because preventive medicine is a term that eugenicist physicians are using 20, 30 years before Farabee is writing. And so it kind of shows us again how these ideas and these movements uh, overlap in, in, really significant, um, in really significant ways. 
uh, Farabee also led a sort of demonstration project uh, uh, for the Birth Control Federation as part of her role on this National Negro Advisory Council where they set up an urban site and a rural site for um, providing birth control and, and sort of reproductive health services. And she deemed this, this project a success because she, for, in her mind it showed that people of all races and socioeconomic strata would be invested in sort of taking up birth control um, if, they're, if they're given the opportunity. And so uh, to add, birth control uh, and eugenics uh, kind of make their way into the black press as well. And so uh, the example on the right hand side here is from uh, a woman named, uh, who goes under the pen name TEB, but her name was Thelma Burlack Boozer, and she wrote a regular column in an African American newspaper called the New York Amsterdam News called The Feminist Viewpoint. And in one of these columns in 1934, she published a piece called Birth Control Gains Sanction, which discussed uh, eugenics and racial improvement. She stated that, quote, we need compulsory sterilization of the mentally and physically unfit. Two, we should welcome birth control as a national measure. She also argued, and if you look at the, the very last line of this uh, fem column, The Feminist Viewpoint, she states that, quote, more well-born babies, fewer ill-born babies, and sterilization of those parents, of, of those unfit to become parents, will aid society in solving some of its major problems. So again, here we see that birth control eug and eugenics kind of become collapsed in this really interesting way and overlap in these really interesting ways. Um, but Boozer is, is sort of echoing the sentiments of a lot of white progressive era eugenicists and birth control advocates who saw things like birth control and compulsory sterilization as kind of um, shared strategies for this sort of broader conversation about racial improvement and to address a whole host of social problems. And so though we find these really interesting moments of collaboration and shared investment in a eugenic vision of birth control, the American birth control movement also reflected the racial politics of, of the early 20th century, right? Its leaders espoused nativist and anti-immigrant sentiment. They sort of operated under the premise of white superiority, even as, even as they're collaborating and working with African Americans, even as they're sort of invested in all women having access to reproductive autonomy. These ideas still are, are a part of, of their discourses. They still are targeting birth control towards immigrant women, black women, because they are assumed to be the ones who will swell the ranks of the unfit. And so if we return to Bousfield's statement about the um, New York branch of the, the Birth Control Clinical Research Bureau, uh, it was not segregated, but other birth control clinics are. So, and having clinics that specifically were in African-American neighborhoods or immigrant neighborhoods was a really important part of the movement's vision. And so uh, in Baltimore, for example, um, just, just down the street from where we would all be if this was all in person, um, the Bureau, uh, we have the Bureau for Contraceptive Advice, which is uh, directed by Dr. Messi Moses, but it also has the supports of um, Hopkins' own uh, eugenicists like Raymond Pearl and Adolf Meyer. Uh, and so the, the Bureau of Contraceptive Advice actually uh, held Negro sessions one day a week uh, for nearly a decade because they didn't want black and white women coming in at the same time. There are other places where the clinics simply do not serve black women. There are other places where there are clinics that are only for black women. And so you get also, again, these, these politics of segregation are also seeping into the movement. And so with the um, loosening of the, Com of the Comstock laws during the 1930s, the, Bol it, the Bureau for Contraceptive Advice becomes the Baltimore Birth Control uh, Clinic in 1932. And in 1942, it becomes Planned Parenthood and moves to the Howard Street location that we all are, are familiar with now. And so it's important to note that there is, um, that this kind of slippage or overlap between what we understand um, as birth control and family planning today is, it's important to recognize what the, what, how that exists and how that overlaps with the ways that, you know, things like sterilization are weaponized against African American women, against indigenous women, and against Latinx women. Um, I think Dr. Schoen's work speaks a lot about this and she'll probably cover more of this in her talk, but um, her work alongside people like Alexander Stern, Alexander Stern, Jennifer Nelson, Dorothy Roberts, Rebecca Kluchin, I could go on and on and on, show how birth control and sterilization um, were mobilized uh, for racist, eugenic, and, and ableist ends. And the, the legacy of Sanger and Planned Parenthood has now been collapsed in some ways into um, 
the structures of eugenics state sponsored sterilization abuse that occurs during and after the eugenics movement. And this, this collapsing leads to narratives of reproductive control as forms of genocide. I think we're, we've seen this kind of rhetoric before. And, um, and then those kinds of narratives exist into the present day. We all just saw what the, the news that broke with the of women being sterilized in ICE facilities without their consent. But also we have numerous examples of this kind of, of sterilization abuse. Um, for example, the story of, of civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who was subjected to what is called a Mississippi appendectomy uh, in 1961. And so the folks that I began this talk with, people like Bousfield and Alexander and Farabee, believe that embracing birth control would benefit the, the collective health and well-being of the race. But what happens is that they don't foresee, in a lot of ways, the ways that tools of birth control and, and sort of eugenic ideas become weaponized and are used against African-American women, um, despite their, their efforts to, to proliferate this information for, for what they understand to be a really positive end. And so I will stop there. That was fantastic. And thank you so much. Really, really fascinating. And it, you know, I think it, it really helps all of us in public health just foreground what, what we do on a daily basis. And I mean, there's so much relevant content in that, those few minutes that you spoke. Thank you. And I look forward to the, uh, talking more in the questions. So, uh, Joanna, are you ready? Okay. So, um, I want to uh, talk uh, today about the way in which birth control sterilization and abortion interact with each other and how women negotiate between state policy and their own um, attempts to uh, gain reproductive autonomy. And I'm going to start uh, with a story of Estelle, uh, who in 1948 was a 12 year old African American girl in Pittsburgh. Um, Pennsylvania. And uh, in that year, without being examined uh, by a physician, the physician concluded that Estelle was four months pregnant. Um, in reality, Estelle, like many teenage girls, had an irregular period and eventually she began to menstruate again. However, at the age of 21 in 1957, Estelle did have, first period, uh, did have her first pregnancy and gave birth to her first child. And uh, after that, she tried to obtain contraceptives, but because she was single, she was ineligible for contraceptive advice. And as a result of that, she had her second pregnancy in 1958, gave birth to the second child, had a third pregnancy in 1959, gave birth to a third child, and in 1961, had her fourth pregnancy and gave birth. Um, and at that point, actually tried to secure an abortion. But by the time she was finally able to find an abortionist, she was too far along and hence gave birth to her fourth child. After that, she tried again to get contraceptives and by now she was married, um, but her husband refused to sign the consent form. At that point, husbands had to sign a consent form. And as a result of that, four months later, she was pregnant for the fifth time, um, at which point she contacted the abortionist immediately and ended the unwanted pregnancy. However, in 1962, she was again pregnant uh, for the sixth time. And by this time, her husband had lost his job and there was no money for an abortion. Um, so Estelle tried a number of home remedies, was unsuccessful and gave birth to her sixth child. Um, this time, uh, following Estelle forged her husband's signature and she got a diaphragm, which uh, she tried to use, but using it was almost impossible because every time her husband discovered that she had the diaphragm in her, he, uh, he beat her. So in 1963, she had her seventh pregnancy, this time a tubal pregnancy. Uh, she went to a physician who removed the affected ovary, um, but despite Estelle's begging that he also remove the other ovary, um, he refused to do so. And by 1964, she was pregnant for the eighth time and gave birth to her sixth child. In 1965, she was pregnant for the ninth time. And after a beating from her husband, her baby was born two months prematurely, the birth of her seventh child. Following that, Estelle again forged her husband's signature, and this time uh, the birth control pill is in existence and she's able to get the birth control pill, and then she goes and buys a gun to protect herself 
um, to protect her pills from her husband and herself for a number of years from pregnancy, and she's successful in doing so. By 1970, however, she has become a diabetic and she has to stop the birth control pills until she gets an IUD. Uh, those are now also available. Um, but the IUD gives her a severe infection and after it's removed, she becomes pregnant again, her 10th pregnancy. This time, however, she can seek a legal abortion and shortly after she separates from her husband. And I just want to point out in this whirlwind of data um, that by the time she separates from her husband, um, she is only 34 years, 34 years old. So she still has many reproductive years left. Now, one of the things that um, I uh, um, uh, talked about and that I want to talk a little bit about is the kind of public health birth control programs that get established in the United States around the country and particularly in the South. Um, the first um, public health birth control program gets established in 1937 in North Carolina with funding from Clarence Gamble, who's one of the heirs of Procter and Gamble. And Gamble has developed a foam powder that if put onto a sponge and inserted into the vagina is supposed to prevent conception. And he sees for the distribution of this foam powder through public health nurses around the country and particularly in North Carolina. And the North Carolina Department of Public Health takes him up on this offer. And these early programs are really driven by a number of different motivations. On the one hand, humanitarian concerns because um, of the very poor maternal and child health in the state, um, public health officials really understand that it is necessary for women to space childbearing rather than to have children as quickly as, for instance, Estelle had them. It is, um, as I have correctly points out, of course, also driven by eugenic concerns and by the general um, perception that the poor, uh, including, of course, African-American women possess a number of undesirable qualities that they're likely to pass on to their offspring. And then these programs are also driven by economic concerns and the very, um, uh, the very strongly held idea that the di distribution of contraceptives to the poor in particular will save taxpayer monies uh, because it will uh, cut down on, um, on welfare uh, roles of poor women with children. And so these programs really start during the Great Depression and they wax and wane over the decades to come. So they're rolled back during World War II and then they again expand in the 1960s as a result of Johnson's war on poverty. In the 1930s, um, these programs really are uh, driven by uh, public health and by the vast array of contraceptive uh, commercial contraceptive products that begin to flood the market in the 1930s. So as testing greatly expanded, there, expands, there are more and more programs through which poor women can get contraceptives. So for instance, there's testing, as I mentioned, of the foam powder that Clarence Gamble develops uh, in North Carolina and Puerto Rico. There is testing of condoms in the Appalachian Mountains. There is testing of contraceptive jelly in Logan County, West Virginia. And then as we get into the 1950s, there is testing of the birth control pill in Kentucky and Puerto Rico. And the health professionals who test these wide range of products basically follow each other's progress and exchange formulas and recommend and discourage the use of one product over another. Researchers during this time comment on each other's tests and negotiate with doctors, nurses, and women over the policies and practices of these contraceptive field trials. And scholars have rightly often condemned the individuals who perform such testing for exploiting poor women as research subjects. So they have uh, pointed out that these trials usually offer unreliable and sometimes dangerous contraceptives to women who were insufficiently informed about the risks and lacked access to any alternative birth control methods. This is certainly true. And the historians have rightly remarked on the race and class politics involved. The testing was done on poor women and um, as at times on African-American women. But I want to point out a little bit other politics that are going on here because to dismiss the trials as merely exploitative is to fail to explain the appeal that they held for the many women who decided to participate in the tests. Um, and there are a number of projects that I already um, pointed to 
that really uh, try to extend this kind of testing to African American women. Now, prejudices about black women's lack of intelligence frequently reinforced health officials' belief during this time period that funding for birth control programs to the black communities were a waste of money. So it was difficult to find programs for African American women to start with. And even sympathetic health professionals regularly assumed that African American women would not be interested in birth control and would not avail themselves to the methods if they were made available to them, or that the methods were too complicated for African American women to use. Um, and that African American women in particular would not accept or carry out the recommendations. In addition to that, contraceptive services were seen as valued services. And so there was also a fear that the allocation of birth control to black women would provoke opposition as a result of that, uh, allocating resources to black communities that should be allocated to white communities. But despite that, already in the 19, late 1920s and early 1930s, there are several places where there's a remarkable system of integrated care, both to black and white mothers. So I'm listing here a couple in Virginia, in Elizabeth City, Dixie Hospital, the University of Charlottesville, University of Virginia in Charlottesville. In Atlanta, there are several institutions that offer services to black women. Um, the Birth Control Federation, with the help of citizens in Asheville, Roanoke, and Wheeling establishes a number of services to black and white women. In Florida, there's a physician, Lydia DeVilbis, who offers birth control advice to both black and white women, and upon request of the African-American community, establishes a clinic in the black community. Uh, and with these public health birth control programs, states like North Carolina and South Carolina also begin to offer services to black and white women. And one thing that already crystallizes during this time period is that black women's needs for health services are so great that they actually tend to take greater advantage of these birth control clinics, regardless indeed of any kind of contempt or paternalism that they might encounter in the clinics. And black women also tend to maintain better contacts with the clinics than white women do. Nevertheless, it is clear in the late 1930s that there are so few clinics in proportion to the need that one observer notes, quote, these are really a drop in the bucket as the South was so vast in this area and its need so great. Um, uh, these services and the kind of testing uh, continues, however, and in 1938, uh, the um, Birth Control Federation of America establishes the so-called Division of Negro Services, and Aya has mentioned that as well. Um, with the financial help of Albert Lasker um, and the vision of Margaret Sanger, they basically try to establish a broad grassroots campaign, uh, which was supposed to be under the direction of African Americans and for the African American community, but Lasker and Sanger immediately run into opposition from officials with the Birth Control Federation, as well as, well as Clarence Gamble, who basically don't feel that African Americans are able to um, direct any kind of programs along those lines and who resist African American control over these programs. And indeed, both BCFA officials and Gamble argue explicitly for the need to control the reproduction of African Americans and not for the need of African Americans to have control over the money that might um, set up these programs. And so in 1940, they launched a number of demonstration clinics uh, in Eastern South Carolina and in Nashville, Tennessee. And these demonstration clinics really are seen as clinics that are supposed to demonstrate that African American women know how to use birth control and will do so when they are offered. And one of the things that is interesting about the clinics is that they have a profound impact on the women who take advantage of them. For, for most of patients who go to these clinics, they are the first uh, place for them to encounter the medical profession. And physicians who examine them in preparation for birth control basically find a number of serious health conditions and then are able to refer patients on to physicians to basically get the medical care they need. And by the end of the testing period, 
520 women in Berkeley and Lee County, South Carolina, and 354 women in Nashville have succeeded in preventing pregnancy during the previous 12 to 18 months. And as Aya already indicated in her talk, these clinics are seen as a success. So the final report of the BCFA basically says that the project proved that properly guided child spacing measures can be practiced even by the most disadvantaged groups um, and that they will bolster maternal and child health and have a number of other benefits. But these programs also come with a number of shortcomings that really are illustrative for the kind of services that African Americans um, see if they get any kind of services at all. So for instance, fearing opposition, health officials basically refuse to publicize the services. And so many women never even learn that birth control is available through these demonstration clinics. There's a high dropout rate. In Nashville, 455 women drop out and 70% of Berkeley County women drop out. And they do so because they can't reach the clinics. Bad roads, bad weather, lack of transportation, lack of clothing, lack of childcare basically means that many women are unable to ever reach the clinic. And clinic attendance in Nashville rises once the clinic offers transportation and childcare and adjusts clinic hours so that women can come despite having jobs. And then of course, most importantly, and most indicative for these kinds of services, suddenly the clinics, uh, the demonstration projects are canceled. So after proving that they're successful, basically health officials decide to terminate the services. And with that, the field force and supplies that are able to, were able to help women uh, stave off pregnancy in the previous years are left no longer and women are only left with rudimentary services to go from. So um, what we can see is that women, once they're able to get access to birth control, indeed um, take advantage of them. And so the services in the 1960s um, uh, then uh, begin to expand again. So during World War II, uh, services get cut, partly because public health um, needs are allocated elsewhere. And then in the 1960s, other, under President Johnson, when Johnson uh, kind of rediscovers poverty, welfare officials again begin to look for family planning as a solution to persistent welfare dependency. Now, there's an important difference in the 1960s compared to the 1930s and 40s, mainly changes in contraceptive technologies. So now we have the IUD and we have the birth control pill. And both of those inaugurate, on the one hand, a new generation of contraceptives uh, whose use is separated from sexual activity, right? So now you, you don't have to worry that your husband will find the IUD while he's having, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the um, diaphragm while he's having sex with you because you take the birth control pill at a totally different time and the IUD, you don't have to worry while you're having sex. And what that means is basically that it increases the chance of women's reproductive control by making birth control more accessible and removing it from the sex act, but it also increases the chance that poor women are, co are pushed into, uh, into uh, birth control services that they don't want particularly tied to the IUD. And so a number of different models emerged during the war on poverty. On the one hand, models that really empower poor and minority women to take control of their reproduction. Um, and here, uh, Wallace Corral's uh, program in Char Charlottesville um, in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and Joe Beasley's program in New Orleans um, really stand as examples. These are programs that, that are integrated into health and social services that offer a cafeteria approach uh, to birth control that are run by people who deeply believe that it is women's decision whether or not to use the programs and that are incredibly successful in drawing in clients. So the Orleans Parish Clinic, for instance, registers uh, 17,459 families by 1969 and 85% of them remain active after 18 months. And in Mecklenburg County, uh, in Charlotte, the 50% of the welfare caseload uh, begins to be part of the Charlotte well, um, of the uh, clinics that are offered by Corral. 
Um, but they also, on the other hand, are a model for reproductive coercion. So the health director in Robson County, North Carolina, for instance, a heavily African American county argues that he has tried birth control pills and he says, I know these people and they don't take them like they ought to. And basically he established a, a family planning program that only offers the IUD and that forces women on welfare to take advantage of the IUD if they want um, uh, welfare services. So the chance of coercion also begins to rise significantly. Um, I want to turn my attention for a moment uh, also to the North Carolina sterilization program, um, partly also because Aya has talked about it and because it illustrates the, um, the two opposite poles between choice and coercion really well. So North Carolina establishes a eugenic sterilization program in 1929 and the eugenic sterilization program runs till 1975 and it authorizes the sterilization of more than 7,000 individuals. Um, the petitions for sterilizations are drawn up by physicians, by public health nurses, and by social workers. And the reason this is important is because it means uh, that social workers, uh, this is the only state where social workers can petition for sterilization, which means that the eugenic sterilization program really offers the homes of poor people in ways that they don't do in any other state of the nation. And one of the things um, to keep in mind here is that it is not the technology sterilization itself that is coercive or liberating to any particular woman, but it is the context in which women encounter the surgery. So poor and minority women, of course, on the one hand, are more susceptible to coercive sterilization and more likely as a group to suffer from sterilization abuse. But women's race and class background alone do not determine the meaning that sterilization holds for them. So yes, um, in the 1930s and 40s, not many African-American women um, come into contact with eugenic sterilization because they are not part of the social welfare roles in North Carolina, we're being in the Jim Crow South, but that changes in the 1950s when federal pressure and a new series of requirements relating to the implementation of um, aid to dependent children programs basically result in black women's inclusion in welfare programs. And once they're included in welfare programs, they're also included um, in, uh, uh, they come in contact with social workers and then they come in contact with the eugenic sterilization program. And the data that you see on this slide very well illustrates this. So from 1929 to 1950, the perspective percentage of African Americans sterilized from the overall caseload is fairly small, 8.6%, but it raise, rises significantly in the 1950s to 1968. That is as far as I had the data, um, where 28.8% of the overall caseload are African American. And there is a very close association between ADC and black female recipients and also an emphasis of the program at that point to pay attention to teenage girls who are often described as sexually uncontrollable. And so um, they are really the ones who are most vulnerable to the course of sterilizations who are most likely to suffer from um, involuntary sterilization. Um, and I have to point out here that it is not only health and social work professionals at this point um, who basically force African-American girls to get sterilized, but as also parents and other relatives who ask for the sterilization of the teenage girls. But there is another side to the sterilization program. And I realize I'm out of time, I'm gonna wrap up. But I do wanna point out that um, of the 8,000 sterilization petitions that I found, there were 468 um, which were for women who really wanted elective sterilization and the majority of those are African-American women. Indeed, in the 1960s, 20% of the annual caseload of women um, were women who wanted to have a, 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 a eugenic sterilization because that was the only way they could get access to any kind of reproductive control. Right, this is still the time period where abortion is illegal and where it's difficult to get access to birth control. And it really speaks to the deprivation that African American women suffer and the lack of access that they have for, uh, to health. 
care and reproductive health care services. And on the average, these women are young. They're 26 years old. Um, they have more than four children. Many of them have five or more children. Um, and they suffer from poor health. They suffer from poverty. They suffer from domestic abuse. Uh, many of them don't have hus husbands at home who help as breadwinners. Um, and they are basically looking um, and approaching social workers for uh, eugenics sterilizations because that gives them a kind of reproductive autonomy that they otherwise don't have. Um, and they also make sure that sex, that social workers know that sex is important to them, that this is really partly something that will increase their sexual, sexual and reproductive autonomy. If we then kind of fast forward and also look at abortion, and I promise this is almost my last slide, um, one of the things uh, that is clear is that abortion during this entire period, and Estelle's story at the very beginning uh, illustrated this, is often women's only hope for reproductive control, but particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century when other contraceptives are available, this is the case. But abortion is illegal until the early 1970s. Um, and we really don't know in the US that there is any kind of history of coercive abortion. So the state comes in as being a coercive actor in terms of sterilization and birth control, but it does not do so in terms of abortion. Indeed, abortion is really a history of restricted access. Estelle tries to get abortions and is unable largely to do so because it's um, illegal. Um, and then after the legalization of abortion with a Hyde Amendment, with 24-hour waiting periods, with trap laws, these are all laws that affect uh, poor women and women of color in particular. Um, and so really what we see after the legalization, particularly starting in the 1980s and going to this very day, is that it is poor women and women of color in particular who are having increasing difficult times to get access to reproductive control. So I think there are a couple of messages that I want to have us take away from this. On the one hand, what we see is that a state's desire to control women's reproduction is constant. Although for most of the time, this has manifested itself through limiting women's access to reproductive control. If we see one thing that is always constant, it is that on in general, women tend to fight for reproductive control, and that includes women of color who are often the most underserved. At times, however, the state also supports programs that aim to force women to use reproductive technologies against their will, so eugenic sterilization, the IUD. Women's experience with reproductive technologies is really embedded in their broader experience seeking access to health and social services. So while the constriction of reproductive services makes it more likely that women will be coerced into methods they do not want, women also have taken advantage of coercive programs because this is the only way they can hope to control their reproduction. And really it is full reproductive autonomy. Um, women can on only gain full reproductive autonomy if they have full access to sex education and healthcare services. So the restriction of services is also one of the tipping points that makes it more likely that women get coerced. Um, okay, so I'm sorry for this uh, kind of, let me end the slideshow. For the, uh, for the um, speed with which I kind of went through this, um, but I think one of the ways that I was trying to indicate is how these are really interrelated to each other and that it is not necessarily predictable how state policies affect uh, women's ability to gain reproductive control over the course of their lifetime. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Aya. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, we can open uh, you can start uh, asking questions in the chat, uh, but I'd like to just make a couple of comments uh, to uh, pull, pull these two papers together and connect them back to our previous seminar uh, when I and uh, Henry Mosley spoke about the history of international family planning and, and race. Um, you know, it's, it's very clear that, that you know, throughout the 20th century, um, the development of family planning was taking pl place 
in a larger context of economic exploitation, both in the United States and in other countries, and that um, uh, the, the effects of both racism and poverty really increases the value of family planning and in the political economy, both for poor and oppressed people like uh, the black leaders that I was talking about, W.B. Du Bois, um, Dorothy Farabee, it increases the value for them because it's seen as a, a tool to um, overcome the, the effects of racism and poverty and enable them to uh, gain more uh, social and political equality as well as economic equality. And I would say the same is true for many people in the developing countries that um, are, are seeking access to birth control and even at the national government level are doing that. But the challenge is um, that it can also increase the value of family planning as a policy tool of oppression and maintaining the racist and uh, classist power of, of whether it's um, uh, Western countries or uh, leaders within the United States. So I think that's one connection. So um, I also was thinking of the connection between um, high fertility and smoking as a public health issue. Um, in the 20th century, uh, the, the middle class and, and the wealthy have generally, not completely, but they've stopped smoking and, and smoking has become associated with being lower class. And, and you can see a lot of examples of that uh, culturally. By the same token, um, most Americans had, you know, quite, American families had quite high fertility uh, until the end of the 19th century. And then Wealthier and middle class Americans begin within their own families without outside help beginning to practice contraceptions and uh, women's education levels rise. Um, and that reduces fertility in those segments of society. But, um, you know, as, as so I'm trying to connect this to our current moment um, in the late 20th century and the early 21st century where um, high fertility now is for, for many people associated with uh, cultural backwardness and, uh, you know, and honestly conservative evangelicalism. And I uh, am in that world, you know, to some extent. And, you know, so there are definitely religious uh, threads running through this. But if you go back to, you know, Aya's paper, the, the black leaders in the 20 and 20s and 30s, they were very closely connected with the black church. Um, the, you know, so, and then as you get into the 60s, so that they were very conservative and, and uh, opposed family planning generally, as did the Catholic church. But then when you get into the 60s, when family planning becomes much more available, um, uh, the, the Black Panthers and uh, the Nation of Islam are both uh, what I would describe as a full quick quiver philosophy of, you know, you should have as many children as possible to advance uh, the, the movement or the race or whatever. Um, so I, I, will, I will stop there, but I really saw a lot of interesting parallels with what Henry was talking about a few weeks ago with um, the shifting politics of international family planning, where China, Latin America, and Africa are in the, in the 60s and into the 70s begin accusing the Western development agencies of uh, trying to target them uh, for racist reasons. But then in the 80s, they really embrace family planning, you know, for its own merits for themselves, especially because of its economic benefits. So that's something I see a clear parallel with uh, what Joanna and I have both talked about. So I'll stop there. And, uh, we do have a question. Uh, is the research, sorry, is the research that is retrospectively asked older black women about pregnancy intentions and timing? Um, I, I can't answer that question. Perhaps someone else can. 
I do know, we didn't really talk about the um, concept of birth spacing, which is very important in international family planning, but encouraging people you know, to, to choose how many children they want and to space the children out further for health outcomes. Uh, but can anyone answer this question about um, older black women and pregnancy intentions? I, I'm not familiar with any study that, that does that. Um, yeah, me neither. Good dissertation also, topic for someone. Well, I'm also worried that historians are, that that's not what we look at. So mm -hmm. it could be that this exists, but it would be a different yeah. discipline. Does anyone on the line have an answer to that question? And any medical anthropologists, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> Um, I think it's worth also mentioning um, the, the these papers have, uh, or these presentations have tremendous connections to the work of Lori Zabin, um, because for, for some of the reasons that have been discussed, the association to some extent of uh, the birth control movement with eugenics and with uh, uh, government-sponsored sterilization and um, coercion that um, you know, Lori, when Lori Zabin, when she was uh, working in uh, inner city Baltimore schools to uh, improve access to uh, birth control, you know, creating clinics in Baltimore city schools uh, and making birth control uh, available to black teenagers, um, some people who opposed the government programs that were uh, promoting that said that she was a, a racist and and they were so I would find it interesting if if we might want to talk about how um, you know if how do we take the criticisms that are based in some truth that there has been coercion and racism in the past how do we address those while still uh, advocating for the tremendous benefits of family planning and I think that's something that Lori did very successfully. She really stood firm and said, yes, there are tremendous public health benefits and uh, you know, there are obvious uh, medical drawbacks uh, for teenagers uh, having children very early uh, and frequently. So that, I, I, I don't wanna take up too much time, but we've got some other questions. Um, Perspective and retrospective measures from the NLSY 79 survey. Okay, good, that's great. Um, uh, so there is possibly information out there that asks, answers the first question. And then the issue of trust should be addressed in relation to, to African and African American women's use of contraception when sponsored by large multinational national foundations. So we have you know, we talked about Clarence Gamble and his mm -hmm. involvement. And of course you have um, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation and various other foundations who uh, have, have promoted some of the, uh, if not outright eugenic, certainly uh, has the potential uh, to be used in that way. So anybody wanna tackle that question? I think trust or mistrust rather is a central part of how and whether or not people take up particular kinds of family planning. Because I think mm -hmm. when you think about multi these big multinational foundations like the Gates Foundation or Rockefeller or these other ones that are sort of operating in the past but also in the current moment, those organizations sometimes in the sort of African American collective memory become conflated with the kinds of state-sponsored sterilization mm -hmm. and sterilization, right. sterilization abuse that we're talking about, right? Like mm -hmm. these large multinational foundations are conflated with being state actors. Mm -hmm. And because there's tremendous distrust of the state, mm -hmm. then how do we trust state actors to sort of administer um, these kinds of things that could be beneficial, but there's an assumption of some, like of a nefarious intention behind mm -hmm behind this the, the behind their willingness to proliferate certain kinds of things um, I think, and i think it feed, this mistrust also feeds into um why the nation of islam the black panthers other groups 
Mm -hmm. Come to believe that organizations like Planned Parenthood are sort of engaged in a form of black genocide because they're again conflated with this long history of sterilization abuse and sexual violence and exploitation. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a, a, a sort of not, they're not sort of disentangled from each other in the ways that people understand their um, sort of real time impact. Mm -hmm. I think the politics are also complicated because of course the charges of race oh. genocide are often uh, the, one of the first places that, that comes from is the pro-life movement, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. so they really... It makes very uh, strange bedfellows with... Yeah, white and not only that, I think it, it really just... Right, and it really, I think, to a certain extent, distorts the where these charges are coming from. So, you know, many women who are in the, uh, in the Black women's health movement, uh, their argument uh, it's not about race genocide, um, but their argument is about getting reproductive autonomy and control for, for women of color in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but that does make the politics very complicated. And I think one of the things that's really interesting in the um, abortion care movement are um, providers of color who really kind mm -hmm. of talk from an ethical standpoint about, who, who redirect the discussion towards saying, every woman uh, and especially women of color need to be able to determine themselves what kind of services they want and that they need to have full access to the services. And, you know, kind of redirect to the fact that the more, more common problem has been a lack of access to services rather than mm -hmm. unwanted services. Right, right. And, you know, and to kind of wrap this all up, and I think we do need to um, I think there's one stop. more question in the chat. Oh, um, yes, cognitive dissonance, having trouble reading it for some reason. Uh, uh, well, that's what it says. Can you address the cognitive dissonance? I'm, right. not, um, uh, I'm not quite sure which one, not that there uh, aren't many, but <laughs> I think that's part of the problem. I, I don't know if I would articulate the kind of tension we're talking about as cognitive, especially for black mm -hmm. women. Like, I don't know if I would call it cognitive dissonance because <laughs> the mistrust is rooted in sort of very real things that exist. Mm -hmm. And so why, why would one entity be more trustworthy over another when there's this history that shows that multiple entities <laughs> right. um, are, uh, are certainly worthy of that mistrust, right? right? I don't know if that's a cognitive dissonance issue or a sort of lack of reckoning with the history and, exp and, and sort of getting information out there to show that these are that there's the mistrust is well founded, but how do we address right. work with and work through that mistrust to achieve, you know, sort of a positive end? And and I think a, a key way to look at that mistrust is that um, if if not for intense racism in housing, jobs, uh, all sorts of other ways. Uh, there wouldn't be necessarily a need for these foundation and uh, state programs because people would have the, uh, the education and the resources to practice family planning as they wish, just as most middle class and wealthy white people do. Uh, so there's, you know, basically the, if you, if you put it that, you know, these groups offering family planning, if they are only doing that, and yet uh, there is the perception that um, the same forces are denying, you know, my group or my community of uh, all of these other terrific things, it's it's really not a good trade-off. So I, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Aya and Johanna. You were both terrific, and I really enjoyed it. And yay, history. <laughs> and, uh, we'll, we'll see you again next month uh, with um, Michelle Norris, and uh, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And Karen, thank you so much for the invitation. It was really fun. Yes, thanks for, for having us. This was really exciting. Um, it was fun to be on a panel with Joanna for the first time. Absolutely. It was fun to be on a panel with Aya. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>